Hi all, and welcome to Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022. My name is Zoran Barak. I'm a principal data architect at Sin7 in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm an Auckland SQL user group organizer. I'm a blogger. I'm an active member of SQL community here in New Zealand and worldwide. Today we're going to talk about the Azure SQL Hyperscale Service tier, and we're going to talk about the Hyperscale architecture in the back. Uh, and we are going to compare traditional Azure SQL architecture with the Hyperscale architecture and see what are the pros and cons and why you should or shouldn't consider for your future workload. But before we start with the session, I would like to special thanks to Microsoft and uh, all the people behind this great, great uh, conference and uh, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and I can imagine how much effort is actually necessary to accomplish and to do something like this in year and year in a row. So kudos to all and uh, thank you for supporting uh, not just the SQL community as uh, attendees as well as speakers. This would be our agenda for today. Uh, it's really hard talking about hyperscale architecture without at least scratching the surface, explaining what is the traditional and what is the, uh, at the moment, most used architecture in Azure SQL platform as a service offerings. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about how uh, how, uh, how Azure actually uh, offers us all those deployment models, purchasing models, service tier, ability models, and how giving us that uh, most in use traditional architecture and as well hyperscale architecture. Bear in mind that hyperscale service tier is just a part of the Azure SQL uh, deployment models and deployment options. So uh, definitely we need to cover all that to be able to understand fully what the hyperscale architecture really is. Uh, so the first part we're going to talk about uh, four concepts behind how the Azure SQL is actually offering us uh, all those deployments and what is in the back, what is actually giving you the architecture in the back and how that works, what kind of redundancy do you have in the back and so on and so on. So first of all, let's see what deployment models we uh, really have there. So. Uh, we can see there is a two big groups and platform as a service offering for Azure SQL. It's a managed instance and databases. In the managed instance, we have a single and instance pool for a single database. For a database, we have a single database and elastic pool. So for uh, uh, all of those are fully managed. Just uh, bear, keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, for a single instance, managed instance, uh, you can see there is a, a 16 terabyte size storage for general purpose service tier, which is a bit bigger than any other offering here, which is leveraging the standard uh, traditional Azure SQL architecture. But for a hyperscale, that goes up to 100 terabytes in size. So that's what we're going to compare through those sessions through this session today and try to explain. Besides that, what else is benefit or not moving to hyperscale? So uh, with the instance, managed instance, you can see there is a four core limit per instance, but there is, then you have an instance pool where that limit is two core. Uh, both of them are fully managed service. Instance pool still cannot be deployed through the Azure portal, but you can use the PowerShell CLI for that. But as you can see, you can host uh, smaller instances with the instance pool. Supports almost all on-prem. Uh, capabilities, so it's basically a lift and shift kind of way uh, of, of migration. Uh, you have an Azure hybrid benefit as well. If you have a license, you can practically bring your license kind of thing and uh, save up to, I think, 45 or 50 percent of the cost for the licensing. It's uh, at least 99.99. That depends on the availability model in the back of it. So if it's going to be standard or it's going to be uh, premium, it's going to be different availability. Uh, it has built-in backups, patching recovery. It's obviously have a latest stable database engine version. And it's, as we already mentioned, easy migration. So for the databases, it's a slightly different. Uh, databases can be deployed across, a single database can be deployed across any 
service tier offerings, which you're going to see the la later on the, one of the future slides. And you'll have a hyperscale service tier there. So that that hyperscale, uh, hyperscale service tier we're going to cover today and explain that architecture because of uh, traditional availability models, we have a standard premium. None of those are actually supporting a hyperscale. Hyperscale is completely different way of how it's architecture, how it's architected. So you have a serverless compute tier as well and general purpose service tier. Uh, for general purpose service tier, and then you have a uh, you have a, a 99.99 up to 99495 availability guarantee. Depends on the what availability model in the back. If it's if it's a business critical service tier or it's a premium DTU service tier, it's uh, it's a premium availability, availability model in the back, which is offering you uh, the highest uh, 495 uh, kind of SLA. So it has built-in backups, the latest stable database engine version. So bear in mind that if you're migrating something, you need to be really careful with the features you're using on your uh, maybe infrastructure service VM deployments where you have your own SQL or you, or you might be using the dedicated machine, but you need to be aware of and do the proper assessment of your workload and the features you're using before you migrate to the database because it's not as uh, like on managed instance situation, we have support almost all on-prem instance database level capabilities. So there is a slight difference there. I mean, it's not a topic for today, but if anybody is interested, uh, can select me, uh, can send me the email or or a message. I'm gonna do my best to reply, explain. Elastic pool. It's more related with the pr price optimization. So which means that uh, you might have a different. Uh, uh, peaks for workloads for a different sets of databases, which is active uh, in a different time. So you can utilize and save the cost with that, keeping all those databases in the same elastic pool. Uh, it's same thing. It's a fully managed service. Let's move on. In the previous slide, we talked about deployment options. Now we're going to talk about availability models that are used in Azure SQL. So. Uh, those two availability models we're going to talk in this slide are related just to the traditional Azure SQL architecture. It's not related to the hyperscale. We're going to explain hyperscale in future slides. So uh, the standard one is mostly similar like a failure cluster instance. So you're going to have a, a shared storage. We're going to share your, we're going to keep your MDF LDF file, which is going to be G redundant. Which I'm going to show in the future slides how it looks like on, on a, uh, in a written picture with a, with a uh, graph and everything. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be uh, based on on separation of the storage and compute. So basically, you have the FLD files on storage, your compute side, your SQL uh, SQL exe, SQL server dot exe, your TEMDB, your buffer, and everything else is going to be on attached SSD. And if anything happens. Uh, Azure Service, Fa Service Fabric is going to recognize that and just fill over to the first node with the spec capacity. But that's not going to be the synchrometer or anything like that. As I said, it's not the full HA. Uh, but the premium availability model is actually offering you that full HA and uh, full nines and a five SLA and so on. You're getting much more. It has a quorum in the back. It's behave like a, uh, like a, having a Windows failover cluster. And so on and on. So there is uh, two service tier. One is the DTU premium one, and one is the vCore purchasing model, business critical one, which is leveraging this premium availability model. This is built for a high IO, uh, high transaction rate. It's one to two millisecond latency in the previous, and the, and the other one is uh, five to ten milliseconds latency. So that's uh, that's again a difference as well. So this is uh, this is one uh, graph I built for uh, trying to explain easier those four concepts behind the uh, Azure SQL Platform uh, as a service offerings. So we have, a, as we said, deployment models. We have a purchasing models and service tier, and we have availability models. So uh, for deployment models. We have uh, two groups and four of them actually available, which is Azure SQL Database, Elastic Pool, and within Managed Instance, we have an Instance Pool and we have an Azure SQL Managed Instance. Then we have a DTU and V Core purchasing models and service tiers. So uh, 
uh, DTU, uh, DTU uh, in V Cordosa purchasing models and everyone, uh, each one of those purchasing models actually have their own service tiers. As you can see, different features. Uh, this is a bit older picture, so you can see the hyperscale service tier is rescale out, which is true, but there is a much more there. You have a zone redundancy as well. You have a named replicas, you have a geo replicas, which is uh, kind of inbuilt G, G option for you, which you don't have with the, with the offerings here, because this is mostly uh, local redundancy and zone redundancy. So that's not the G redundancy. And you can see availability models in the back that every each one of those uh, purchasing model service team in the back is actually supporting and leveraging one of those two, except the hyperscale. And hyperscale uh, is a different architecture. So in the previous slides, we covered uh, those four concepts in the back, which is actually creating the full picture of the Azure SQL platform as a service offerings. So we talked about the deployment options. We talked about uh, uh, service tier and purchasing models, and we talked about availability models, which actually the dictates that architecture and how that's going to look like in the end and what kind of redundancy you're going to have. So now we are going to platform Azure SQL architecture. Uh, again, uh, at the end, it's going to be hyperscale. Uh, but before we reach hyperscale, we need to explain how the traditional look like. So you have a full picture when you finish this session and you know if this is the best option for you or not. So we're going to talk about redundancy option. Then we're going to cover those availability models. First going to be a standard one and all the service tiers in the back and the premium one and all the service tiers in the back. And then we're going to talk about the hyperscale. So what is the redundancy? What do we get deploying uh, any of those options uh, from a box, uh, sort of speaking? So uh, if you deploy, if you deploy any any uh, deployment model, any deployment options you choose, is going to have a some redundancy. It's going to have a local redundancy. Now, if you work with the always on and failover cluster instances or anything like that to achieve availability on the VMs or dedicated SQL instance, you know how much work that uh, uh, demands. So, like uh, just to just to cover that file domain and update domain. You need to think about availability sets and proximity and so on and so on. Uh, that's all already integrated in, in any of those deployments. So you're going to have all that pretty much covered. So if you have a, uh, any of those uh, with the local, any, any option you choose is going to have some kind of local redundancy. So as I said, if you go with a standard availability model, which is uh, DTU basic and DTU standard, is using that one general purpose from a vCore using that one you're gonna have a, a local redundancy with that and if you go with premium obviously it's gonna be a little bit different architecture in back but the DTU premium and the vCore business critical service is actually leveraging that so with the zone redundancy you're gonna have with any of those using uh, uh, premium availability models so you're gonna have a if you go with the uh, with the DTU purchasing model premium uh, premium uh, service tier and if you go with the vCore purchasing model business critical service tier you're gonna have option to do availability zones so that's gonna be your zone redundancy so what is the difference between that local and zone one and even a general purpose for a for a vCore uh, with the standard availability model offering you that with the some cost involved which we're gonna see in the next slides one of the next slides so what would be the main difference between that local one and zone one? Well, the main difference is that with the local one, you have kind of attached to one data center with the zone one and in the same region, multiple data centers have across have your database on. So if something happened with one data center, you still have a, a, a available your database and all the workload and all the traffic or anything you hold there is going to be available in a different uh, uh, zone, but that's still within the same Azure region. So that's not regional redundancy. The only way to achieve that with uh, with the standard uh, with the standard architecture is to do the G redundant availability. With G redundant availability, it's, there is a few ways you can actually accomplish that. One of the most used is uh, filler groups. 
So basically you create failure group in your primary SQL, create another SQL, let's say one is in Australia East, the second one is in uh, US East, East and uh, you just uh, async database in between. So if you add database to that, failure group is going to be G-replicated immediately and uh, you're going to have a listeners for that uh, failure group as well, read, write and read only. And that's going to be your geo-redundant availability eventually. But as I mentioned in beginning, at the beginning, one of those slides, that hyperscale uh, have an option for your secondary replica to be geo-replica. So what you can do, you can spin that somewhere else outside of your region and actually have the proper DR. So as I already mentioned in a previous slide, uh, with any deployment you choose, you're gonna have a, some way of redundancy and uh, at least local redundancy is gonna be there. This is the basic and standard DTU purchasing models. Those are basic and standard service tiers. And this is the general purpose service tier from um, uh, vCore purchasing model. They all leveraging the standard availability model. So as we already said, the standard ability model, it works like something like a filler cluster instance. Uh, this share is sharing the drive, your LDF, MDF files are gonna keep on the Azure premium storage, locally redundant storage, and the backup file are gonna be the Azure standard storage, uh, G-redundant storage. So you can see that primary, primary replica is uh, uh, actually directly communicate with the Azure Premium Storage and uh, uh, having SSD attached, but that SSD is for 10 dBs and uh, uh, buffer pool and plan cache and so on. In case something happens and failover occurs, you're gonna have a, a failover to the first node with the spare capacity, which is gonna be reconnected to your data and uh, uh, um, MDF LDF files. So uh, you're not gonna lose any data there and uh, uh, your connectivity is going to be redirected immediately to the gateway control ring, so you shouldn't worry about that. So, this what I already mentioned. If you need to achieve something like this with the with a, with the VMs or with the dedicated in SQL instances, you need to put a bit effort and work. This is just with deployment you are getting uh, this. So this is general purpose. Uh, a general purpose service tier for a, a vCore purchasing model, uh, which is leveraging the standard availability model. This is the zone redundant availability. Uh, it's uh, it's in preview. Uh, there is some additional cost with it is going with this, but you have option with this. You don't you're not going to have a low just a local redundancy. You have a zone redundancy within same region and different data centers. But you need to deploy to the data centers with this is. Uh, available, uh, I mean, uh, data center, sorry, region, but this is available. Available. So yeah, that's uh, kind of like option for you. And uh, of course, you need to use the Gen 5 compute hardware needs to be selected to be able to do zone redundancy. As you can see uh, that uh, in this case, when you have a zone redundancy in the previous slide, for a same general purpose with thousand redundancy, you had a Azure Premium Storage, but was local redundant storage. Now it's a zone redundant storage because all those nodes with the spare capacity needs to be the different data centers. So they need to be across all those zones and the backup is still a G redundant storage as was in the previous slide. So premium DTU, premium service tier, DTU purchasing model, a business critical service tier, which is the vCore purchasing model, they leveraging both uh, uh, premium availability model. So, what is giving you? It's a full HA. So in this case, like in previous slide, you saw you guys saw that uh, those LDF MDF files lives in the Azure Premium Storage instead of attached directly to the VMs or directly to those nodes. Now you have actually the uh, one primary, three secondaries. Uh, one of those taking the filler uh, filler role, role here, and you're gonna have a, a if you enable uh, the read option you can have a readable secondary as well. So you can redirect your traffic with the application intent uh, read only, you're gonna redirect traffic to there. But in this case, this is still local redundancy is attached to the one uh, data center, but you can see if anything happens and uh, Azure Service Fabric is gonna fail over you automatically to uh, 
to the uh, failover node, which is going to have all your data. The only thing which is not going to be replicated is your uh, TemDB, obviously. But your MDF LDF file is going to be attached directly to your SSS, SSD, which can be re directly attached to your uh, replicas. So this is fully sync commit. So there is uh, there is a cap and a limit on the LDF throughput. It's 96 megs, but Microsoft is doing the best to change those things. Like a year and a half ago was 48 megs, so now it's doubled. And it's going to go up for a high hyperscale. For example, it's 100, uh, 105. Uh, but the difference is that uh, for, a, for a hyperscale, it's not attached to, it's irrespective of whatever you have for your compute node. So it doesn't matter how many V cores you have for your compute node. So uh, this is mo mostly look like your a full HA, uh, high availability you have with the Windows filler cluster and the quorum and everything else. It's related, as I said, if its region is down, this is down. This is like this is attached to data center at this moment, but next slide is gonna show you how it look like having you have the same same uh, purchasing model DTB core and uh, premium business critical service tier, but with the uh, with the zone redundant availability. So again, there is a reason why is a cap on the log throughput because this is a uh, this. Premium availability have sync commit in the back. So if you have too big traffic, too much to move, uh, it's not that easy having keeping uh, all in SLA, which they guarantee you. So that needs to be fully synced at all time. So backups are G redundant storage, obviously. And you can see that if failover happens, here is going to happen the different data center in the same region. So it's a different zone. And there is an Azure traffic manager that's holding your gateway uh, and control rings and everything else, those load balancers in the back and everything else. You don't, you're not going to see those things. It's happening in the back. And that, that zone redundant option is not available for a managed instance. So in the previous slides, we were talking mostly about the standard uh, Azure SQL architecture, traditional Azure SQL architecture, we can say. This is the hyperscale architecture. It's not leveraging the premium availability model, it's not leveraging the standard availability model. It's completely different how they build, but it's not everything new there because uh, it's basically used some of the features, pre existing features already in uh, some of the SQL Server version we already used before on dedicated on VMs or wherever. So we are talking about the resilient buffer pool, ex uh, resilient buffer pool extension. We are talking about the uh, accelerated data recovery and database recovery page page versioning. So uh, basically, we're talking about the uh, read commit snapshot and snapshot uh, isolation. And we're talking about snapshot backups and restore point in time restore. So uh, in this next few slides. We're gonna just summary those comparison between the traditional and the hyperscale, and then explain how the hyperscale actually uh, manage that such a big databases and how to manage such a big, restoring such a big database in point in time and so on. So here you can see some of the uh, basic facts. If you compare the traditional one and the hyperscale, so max storage size, because those facts can be like stoppers for you moving um, towards hyperscale for any particular reason. Like in this case, your database is bigger than, let's say, uh, four tera, and uh, you you need one to two millisecond latency, and you want full HA, you need to have your readable secondary option. Uh, you can't go with the 16 on MI on general purpose. You want to go, uh, but you still want to go for fully managed service. Then you can, in, you should use the hyperscale. But there is a different reasons. This is just explaining you how that look like. It's a funny thing. Uh, in one of my previous sessions when I was talking about the hyperscale, uh, one of the layers in hyperscale is called page service. Actually, it's uh, 
those page servers are holding your, uh, st they're tied to your Azure storage and communicate directly. But the point is that when you deploy the hyperscale, they say the size is from 40 gigs to 100 terabytes option. Why? Because the case was when you deploy the hyperscale database, it was initially creating a file which is which was size was allocated size was 10 gigs and every 10 minutes was adding the 10 gigs up to 40 gigs you couldn't go below that so when i say they changed that recently i really mean recently like you're talking about days maybe week or so they deploy that uh, cross worldwide now it's not 40 gigs anymore and i have confirmation from microsoft about that they're gonna update the uh, the page as well is saying still 40 to 100 and now it's from 10 and up and uh, it's not creating those four uh, page server and page file in the back it's actually creating only one so uh, there is slight changes and that's I'm mentioning that because Microsoft is doing all those changes ongoing and uh, you need to be aware of those things in in some amount like when you're going to the fully managed service if you have anything uh, using, let's say, discontinued uh, features or, 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 or deprecated even, maybe in the future is going to be discontinued, you need to be aware that that's going to stop working once they update and patch because you can't control that side of the platform as a service. They're going to have the latest stable version all the time with all patched and uh, updated. So CPU. It's similar with one uh, correction there that uh, Hyperscale is going to add uh, a, the next generation. Now it's still Gen, gen 5 of the uh, compute and configuration in the back of your compute. Latency. So uh, premium ability model is 1 to 2 milliseconds. Standard is 5 to 10 for a standard and traditional architecture for a Hyperscale. That latency is not calculated the same way because that decoupling... Uh, log service from a page server from a compute from a storage is actually reason for that is they want to have a multi-tiered architecture and uh, uh, multiple levels of caching so yeah it can happen that you read some of the pages from directly from a, a Azure standard storage which sounds like really slow but really you're gonna hit that if you if you tune that properly and your workload and everything else in the, uh, in in the back of it you're really gonna hit that like that's uh, just in a few occasions gonna happening like uh, mostly you're gonna hit the active hot uh, cache on the compute and the page server as well uh, log throughput this is what I mentioned that uh, with the with the with the hyperscale it's uh, uh, it's regardless how many number of cores you have it's a 105 and with the with the traditional one is going with the obviously with the core so backup and restore uh, backup and restore on a traditional one depends on the side obviously it can take time if you if you try to restore 16 terabytes on general purpose MI it's gonna take time snapshot based backups and i'm going to see one of the slides going to show you how it look like because of the snapshot backups and adr in the back which we have as a feature it's really constant time uh point in time recovery uh, point in time restore so it's, it's absolutely lightning fast and uh, amazing so this is the hyperscale service stability this is uh, gonna see this picture everywhere on the internet is from microsoft uh, uh, page official page uh, what we are seeing here you can have we still can have multiple pages obviously but with the deploying which i mentioned earlier you're not gonna have immediately four uh, that purpose for those four was the for a io reason to elevate the number of wires you can actually do but uh, uh, you're still gonna have uh, once you fill out the drive and size it's gonna create another one you don't need to worry about that so uh, how that look like and what do we have we have a compute node nodes as a first layer uh, you don't need to memorize all this which I'm saying now because we're gonna go one by one anyhow this is just overall picture what we're gonna have so the the size is gonna go from 10 to 100 terabytes it's not going to be from 40 as I already said it's changed a few days ago 
is going to be uh, using the snapshot backups and uh, as I said, utilizing the accelerated database recovery is going to be really, really fast and cost and time. You see that log service is completely separated. Even log service is tiered and have a multiple layers there. And you have a page service as additional second layer of cache. So you have a primary one, which is going to be compute node, and you have a readable secondary, which is going to go up to four. But besides those up to four, secondaries can be named secondaries as well, named replicas, which can go up to 30, and you have a you can have a G replicas as well. So uh, before before. Once you move to hyperscale, you can go back. Now is reverse migration possible if you if you migrated previously. So you can go from a, a Azure SQL database to hyperscale, and you can go back to the general purpose. Uh, only if you didn't build that, uh, deploy that as from a scratch as a hyperscale database. So let's, as I said in the previous slides, uh, this. A hyperscale architecture actually has a good foundation from before uh, because some of those feature existing so for example buffer pool extension which is uh, hyperscale is using resilient buffer pool extension but it's a the foundation was the same uh, was existing since six sequel 2014 which basically what is buffer pool extension is it's uh, extending the memory buffer cache and uh, you can put that on a ssd drive and use it as a, as additional memory and uh, it's can do significantly improve of uh, io throughput for uh, for example small random i operation and so on uh, it's it, it it works similar for buffer pool extension, resilient buffer pool extension. The only big difference because the hyperscale is using resilient buffer pool extension. An important difference that this RBPX cache is actually uh, recoverable after a failure. And uh, two layers in a hyperscale architecture actually using it. Compute replicas is using it as well. Uh, page server servers are using the same thing. And the, the purpose is the same, is keeping the most frequent access data for both uh, uh, this recoverable version and before. Uh, what can we say there? Uh, for example, if you want to check uh, the size of your hyperscale uh, current, uh, for a com we're talking about a compute, uh, compute uh, layer. So if you want to check the size, you can you can use uh, and check. I think it's DMIO virtual file stats. Yeah, that's the DM. Uh, it's actually a function you can use to actually check that size of your uh, uh, resilient buffer pool extension. The uh, size will be three times of your active memory. So your memory is going to basically depends on the number of V cores you deploy for your compute. So if your compute is, let's say, two cores time 0.1, I think, 5.1, I think, that's, that's going to be around 10 gigs. So the resilient buffer pool extension size is going to be three times that, around 30 gigs for that particular one. The next feature or option we can say exists long time as well. It's a uh, raw versioning, it's a uh, version store kind of like feature. Uh, so basically there is some isolation level you can use, uh, which is going to use the raw versioning, utilize the TEMDB and creating those version in TEMDB. So this, uh, what would be the difference between the platform as a service offerings? Uh, all platform as a service offerings are actually using Recommit snapshot for our for our primary and snapshot for our secondaries. At the same time, if you deploy on the VM infrastructure as a service or you deploy on the dedicated SQL instance, you're gonna have a read commit as a uh, as a uh, default and snapshot is gonna be off. So bear in mind uh, this is the snapshot there is for a reason is to uh, ensure that write transaction do not block read transaction and uh, as well opposite. So it's basically what is doing is increasing your concurrency and reduce 
locking and blocking. But at the same time, due to you, you actually using TempDB to store uh, your uh, previous modified rows, last modified rows, uh, you can create additional traffic on TempDB. But that, that mostly depends on uh, workload. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, there is a slight difference between the read commit snapshot and the snapshot. Read commit snapshot actually can have non-repeatable read be reads because that read commit snapshot is actually uh, have a statement level consistency, so it can produce non-repeatable reads, which means that you can basically have different results uh, for the same SQL statement with the same transaction. Uh, so what is this row versioning means for a hyperscale? The difference is that before, like in even premium availability model and standard availability model and platform as a service, you still have TAMDB attached to SSD. It doesn't matter which availability model you use. TAMDB is attached and on SSD attached to the node. It's not shared between the nodes. Even failure happen. Uh, whatever is there is lost. It. So, hyperscale utilizes shared disk architecture and keeps uh, keeps raw versions in a shared disk. So, that's one of the huge huge benefits because, as I said, in in traditional one you didn't have this ability. So, doesn't matter which ability model you used, your TMDB was on SSD, which is uh, even if you had a full sync. A full commit uh, commit sync in a uh, uh, availability model which is premium for a uh, uh, premium DTU and record purchasing model service tiers uh, you couldn't do that because SSD uh, from SSD everything else is replicated except the TMDB. The next one is uh, ADR accelerated database recovery which is uh, the feature which exists in 2019 SQL version and in different ideas and different shapes uh, the main goal was to uh, increase availability during the recovery process of long-running queries. So you, you all, which anybody who's working SQL knows that uh, rollback of transaction can take a uh, similar time as the running the same transaction or even more because it's single threaded. So uh, that can be a, a big problem for availability because it just takes time, but you you're gonna see in a few next slides how the ADR actually works with the uh, with the raw versioning as well and uh, with the uh, point in time restore, uh, which actually utilize the ADR. Uh, so I think we covered mostly all. Uh, there is nothing else there like there is other features we can mention but uh, like a snapshot backups but we're gonna talk we're gonna have a separate slide just for that so that's so how this sql database hyperscale actually works what do we have in the back we say we have a primary compute nodes we have a secondary compute nodes we have a ha name replica g replica the whole option for a secondary compute node. then we have a separated lock service additional layer caching layer which is the page server which is actually directly tied to uh, Azure Standard Storage, same as the log service, they are directly tied to Azure Standard Storage. We're gonna see how that actually look like. So the compute nodes. Uh, the role of the compute, when you deploy the hyperscale, firstly, when you deploy the hyperscale, you choose the number of cores, you choose the generation you want, you choose the, uh, with, the with the number of cores, you're gonna have your number of, uh, uh, you're gonna have your memory. You're gonna have a size of your RB, RBX as well, a resilient buffer pool extension as well, RBPX. Uh, so you're gonna have that all predefined once you once you just deploy your your hyperscale. So what's gonna happen in a moment? You might you might not. You might want to have the secondary. You don't have to choose the secondary in that case. Even if you don't have a secondary, which by default is gonna be your HA replica you're still gonna have a, a, a redundancy there. So uh, if anything happened with your with your compute one, primary compute one, you're gonna fail over to the secondary, which is gonna be uh, the node with spare capacity, even if you didn't deploy your secondary HA replica. 
So if you decide to choose your HR replica, it's going to be a bit faster because uh, it's always going to be there. Cache the data because the second replica have as well, same as the primary one. You have a resilient buffer pool extension uh, cache and you have a buffer pool as well on all of them and the SQL Server exe, uh, process happening as well. So uh, that will be for the, that's the first uh, first layer of the hyperscale and you as as you can see from a picture there is a read write and read only traffic if you don't specify intention to go to the secondary uh, uh, if you specify intention with the connection string several server will enforce the intent at the connection time and it just redirect you to the secondary if not it's gonna all read write and it's gonna even read only is gonna go to primary let's see the next one log service Lock service is completely separated and it's play a really important role. I I didn't mention in previous slide, but for a for a, a compute replicas for a primary node is uh, when when we're talking about the let's say availability model in a standard traditional platform as a service architecture, SQL architecture, architecture Azure SQL architecture. Uh, those nodes are in a full uh, sync commit mode so they need to understand what is already sent there they need to communicate they need to have a kind of like a full interaction in a hyperscale not really uh, the primary node doesn't need to know what else is there uh, uh, directly but he gets those information from the log service and caching them in their resilient buffer pool extension cache so the log service have multiple roles log service uh, send the data and update pages for a secondaries for your compute secondaries as well doing that for your page server if anything is missing and it's uh, it's a partially updates you just update those for a secondary for secondary replicas where uh, the page server already exists in a buffer buffer pool and just uh, for those active one but if it's a query completely new and it's a read only query which should go to the to the secondary it's going to add those as well to the buffer pool of that particular node so this separation of the of the log itself is built so you can get lower latency and speed up the process even even uh, the the uh, the blog service is running uh, his own executable, which is like xlog srv.exe. That's the file which is running in the back. As well, uh, you have different storages in the back. That's the reason why I said even log service is multi-tiered, because you have a landing zone, which all the logs gonna go first there, and just those uh, 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 hardened logs are gonna go there, and those uh, uh, long-term log for a purpose of point in time restore is going to be uh, uh, saved on the Azure standard storage but for a landing zone is going to be Azure premium storage the reason is the IO so we're going to see one of the future slides you're going to show us how that actually look like from a read perspective and transaction and from a write perspective so I'm not going to go too deep now because we're going to have the whole process like what's happening when connection request happens and so on so on. So this is the page server now. This is the second caching layer you have after the uh, after the compute nodes and compute layer uh, which holding the, the primary one, the secondary replicas. This is the page server. So as I already mentioned before, once you deploy uh, your uh, hyperscale Azure SQL database, you got your 40 gigs you wanted or not because every 10 minutes was added 10 gigs that would be uh, so that would be equal to one page server so basically i'm talking just about the allocated size it's not real size not you know you didn't put anything in obviously you just created the hyperscale database but now it's not the case anymore and when i say now it's literally a few days ago uh and i was doing some testing and uh, noticed that and uh talk with Microsoft that got confirmation they changed that it's a 10 gigs now uh, it's not necessary having uh, for our purposes those four uh, pages deployed instantly but you're gonna have a pages obviously how the database grows is gonna add after you fill out that that file 
in the size which is 128 to up to one terabyte per one file uh, and uh, they're gonna add additional one automatically uh, bear in mind when we talked about compute I didn't say uh, but it's really important to understand it's not uh, uh, non covering the compute is using non covering cache page servers using covering cache so non covering cache in terms like you're not gonna hold your whole database in that cache there not necessary just those hot pages and uh, in page server case is that uh, they basically hold uh, tied directly to the to the data file in the back which is I already said it's 128 gigs or one terabyte in size uh, all those data files are managed by page server so Azure storage so one of the biggest uh, kind of differences than what we what we had in the standard uh, architecture, how we did the backups, and actually, it's not about just how we did the backups. It's about how we communicate with the LDF MDFIs we're holding on the side of the uh, of the Azure storage, and how that point in time recovery process actually runs. And that's the biggest benefit of uh, of uh, Azure SQL Database Hyperscale Service tier. So you can see here that those snapshot backups are created on uh, on uh, in, in 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 intervals so you're going to have them for each of those page server and the data subsets in the back which is managing maintaining by that page server you're going to have those snapshots and so if you decide so those 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 backups those snapshots it's just the delta this is just the differentials from the base file that's not the full backup in any way so if you if you decide to do point in time restore uh, to another location, what's basically is going to happen? It's going to find and copy the latest snapshot to the new Azure storage allocated space for that particular new database. Then, because your uh, log service hold the landing zone, which is Azure Premium Storage, but for a purpose point in time recovery is actually using Azure storage, uh, Azure standard storage for a, a long term storage. It's going to find, it's going to find uh, the, the uh, log serial, uh, log sequence number of the oldest transaction from the latest snapshot. So basically in the picture you can see it's going to go from the latest snapshot, grab everything which is left up to point in time you want to restore. So when it's deployed, let's say, okay, I, I, I triggered the button, I want to restore, new page server is going to be spent and it's going to be synced from the latest snapshots. It's going to attach to those snapshots and it's going to sync them. And the new log service syncs the landing zone on the on a premium storage. That's Azure premium storage, obviously, for the landing zone. And that landing zone is going to fill primary compute once is online is going to pick up the logs from there and all this all this process happening really fast for the reason you're using uh, accelerated database recovery so that feature is actually uh, with the azure storage and snapshot backups ability giving you this leveraging this constant time uh, restore because this doesn't really matter how big the database is, it's going to be a constant time restore. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits of hyperscale, if you ask me. So how this all really works together on a hyperscale architecture? So what if some client or application said this data read request or data write request and read only request or what is the log throughput cap? Uh, what is maintaining that so you basically there is a limit via log rate governance on top of the hyperscale which is saying it's a 105 that's your limit for a, a log throughput but there is something called primary compute log rate throttling uh, where hyperscale decides itself to throttle itself before even reaching that uh, that uh, governance limit so how that actually look like is this so 
all connection requests, uh, read write transaction are coming through compute node. Point is that if you specify a request as read only and put application 10 equal read only in your connection string, server will enforce the intent at the connection time and redirect the traffic to a secondary compute. If any other case, it's going to go to primary. So we already mentioned that primary and the secondary at the same time, but let's 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 say it's a it's a read transaction, not read only. It's not specified read write transaction going to a primary. We have a, a resilient buffer pool extension there, and we as well have uh, what we have is the buffer pool itself, which is going to hold as in memory, which is going to hold your pages. So uh, it's a non-covering cache and it stored data pages only partially, which means that just those pages, which is a uh, kind of hot cache, recently read, modified, and so on. If you send a read request to the primary compute and that page is missing, the primary is gonna send a request for a, a page server, which is gonna be get page ls send request to give that page if it's if it's existing in a page server. So what does that really mean? What's gonna happen if uh, if that page server is not up to date? If ellison is not up to date, then page server needs to pick up that from somewhere, and the page server is gonna send a request to get log block from a, from a log service and look for that particular page to update data because if a primary doesn't have if page server doesn't have and just bear in mind that page server is going to count as uh, sorry for that is going to count as per remote uh, read so uh, once you start doing the performance tuning on the troubleshooting on top of the hyperscale you're going to be more familiar what uh, dmvs you can use and check uh, and uh, to figure out what's happening when your workload and if you're reading from a cache because bear in mind that reading from a from a compute nodes is the fastest option you have then uh, if you're reading from a page server obviously if it's up to date it's gonna be fast enough if it's not then needs to send request get log block from a log service and get applied at log and return page uh, particular page to the primary replica but that's gonna create waiting time and it's gonna be page I latch waiting time, which uh, you probably familiar with uh, SQL Server, any version, basically, you can see those uh, waits happening. So we already said that uh, there, is a, there is a governance on top of, uh, of on top of the kind of like a log throughput cap. It's 105. Uh, about that you can't go that's the megabytes per second you can go and not more than that but uh, in hyperscale there is something called throttling on primary compute replica and the reason is for maintaining the SLA because the if there is any delays like in um, updates as I already mentioned that page server might be don't have that page yet and it's in delay uh, if there is a there is actually a threshold of one gigs one gig so if uh, there is any delay more than that the throttle is going to happen and uh, it's going to trigger different uh, type of weights with that but uh, again weights going to happen so length length of that throttling is going to depend on uh, how behind our page server not just page server uh, secondary replicas as well any of those might have the issue because they all request pages from a from a, a log service page server and the secondary replicas they're not requesting from a compute node at any stage so yeah that's how it works in general i uh, we can talk about this much more and more in detail but i don't think in this session we have enough time it's just one hour session so I need to move to the second slide but if you if you anybody have like question regarding this and uh, anything basically just contact me over or connect with me over the LinkedIn or contact me via email or any other way you might find more suitable
So this is a summary. Uh, what do we have on the standard ability model, premium ability model? What service tiers and what purchasing model we have in the back? And uh, what do we have uh, uh, on the hyperscale service ability? So what we said already, it's uh, the standard ability model is closest to failover cluster instance. It's a shared drive. Uh, runs on ssd runs sql server exit mdb buffer that's what i said about the version store and uh, what is the difference between uh, standard or premium and the hyperscale because this is not a shared uh tamdb it's basically tamdb on ssd which is attached to the node so even if failure happens that's gone so uh it has uh mdf ldf files are on uh, on azure standard g redundant storage uh, there is also option for a general purpose service tier uh, for a vCore purchasing model. There is an option for a, a, a zone redundancy. So you can actually split uh, in the same region, different zones, different data centers, your database. It's closer, as I already mentioned, closer to the failover instance and uh, it's used shared storage. That's for a, in, what is uh, important for a standard ability model. Premium availability model is more likely to uh, look like a Windows failure cluster and always on availability group configuration. All nodes are in sync commit and hold full copy of database. There is also zone redundancy option there. Uh, again, that's uh, if a region is done, all is done. So this is uh, zone redundant is across the different data centers with the same region. Uh, you can have read uh, read only scale out so you can basically have a readable secondaries uh, uh, they're all in sync commit and if i missed anything you can uh, when you deploy with deployment of the any premium any deployment options for a premium leveraging the premium ability model you're going to have a four nodes in the back so if you do the g redundant on top of that and do the failover group you're going to have basically eight in the same zone redundant machine you're going to have a zone redundant way you're going to have a eight uh, machine across the globe basically four in one location and four in another location so you can imagine how hard is maintaining that if you need to maintain the windows for a cluster and everything else so hyperscale service capability it's a multi-tree multi-tier architecture it's go basically four uh, we can say four tiers uh, uh it's uh for our redundancy purposes, of course, is uh, uh, the to lower the latency and everything else uh, to build that kind of way. Uh, compute node is uh, stateless and it's just running the SQL Server exe and having a buffer buffer pool as well in memory and having the resilient buffer pool extension. Uh, the advantage is that uh, you have one compute and you can go up to four HA secondary replicas and as well you can have a G replica for disaster recovery scenarios which you don't have on a premium and standard ability model for a traditional architecture Azure SQL architecture you can go up to 30 named secondary replicas which is a great benefit because you you can utilize those those uh, named secondary replicas because you can you have full control over it and uh, what you can do you can uh, have your own connection strings and so on so on redirect the traffic uh, some uh, let's say if you have a uh, web uh, kind of like uh, application and maybe mobile application you can redirect to the read on the traffic to the different uh, named replicas so name page server is a second cache layer in a hyperscale uh, what else is there it's holding 128 to one terabyte in size uh, uh, it's maintaining subsets of the data uh, pay when you deploy this pay, bear in mind the page service actually have a replica itself immediately after you deploy it and it's active active configuration uh, restores point in time recovery is extremely fast it's a constant uh, time uh, doesn't doesn't depend much on size because uh, of those uh, snapshots backup and uh, uh, ADR we're using in the back and uh, uh, it's giving you a kind of leveraging compared with the uh, traditional architecture look this is what we can put in one hour and i think it's, uh, it's i think 60 minutes past so uh 
I would like to say uh, special thanks again to Microsoft, all the people behind this uh, great event. Uh, I would like to say thank you for having me here. And uh, if anybody, if you have any question, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'm going to do my best to answer as uh, accurate as I can. Uh, again, to win prizes, post the selfie with the hashtag and uh, yeah, you can follow up these uh, instructions and yep, yeah, hope to see you all on some other end soon. Yep, yeah, thanks. Bye.